Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Rick Flagg. Played by Joel Kinnaman, Rick Flagg was in the 2016 Suicide Squad film, directed by David Ayer, and it wasn't received well by the public, so much so that fans have been petitioning for a release of the hashtag Ayer Cut. But that's, uh, yeah, it's not gonna happen, I don't think. But we do get another shot with our loved characters. This time around, Rick Flagg looks even more badass. Rick Flagg is an elite soldier and government agent who works for Task Force X. So like we see in the film adaptation, Rick is the leader of the first Suicide Squad. Yes, there are more than one, which I'll get into later. Amanda Waller enlisted him when she created the Suicide Squad, which is a task force made of supervillains who take on these high risk missions in order to get parole, reduce sentences, freedom, something glorious, something to look forward to, to use their abilities in a good way, or some kind of good way. He made his first comic book debut in The Brave and the Bold, issue 25, titled The Three Waves of Doom. And we're looking forward to seeing James Gunn version of him come August 4th. The third wave of doom sounds familiar up here in Canada, hence why I'm in my apartment. And before we continue with some other dangerous Suicide Squad members, guys, that like button needs some love right now. You can feel it, I don't know, it's right there. It wants a little so if you wanna go ahead and click that, it helps our studio out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's get right back into this list. I don't wanna to waste too much every time. Number nine, Bloodsport. <laughs> Idris Elba is making the jump from a major Marvel character to a major Superman villain. That's right, Bloodsport. He made his first comic book debut back in Superman Volume 2, Issue 14, and the first Bloodsport, there's of course more than one, that's how these things go, classic comic book villains, but the first one was Robert Dubois. Robert got drafted as a young man, but instead fled to Canada, and his brother had to take his place instead. Now his brother Mickey ended up losing his arm and legs when he got drafted, so Robert was a little messed up after carrying that guilt with him. So much so that he spent the next 12 years going back and forth between psychiatric hospitals. That is until Lex Luthor found him and used him as a way to take down Superman. He gave Robert this device that could teleport any weapon to him, and one of them of course being a gun that fires needles of kryptonite. So they used his guilt and made him into one of the most feared members. Whatever version of this character we get in the James Gunn film, I'm sure it will be a blast. Pun intended. Number eight, King Shark. And? Yes, that is your hand. Very good. Yeah, it's kind of hard to miss that guy in the trailer because, you know, he's a shark. We have a shark now. Great. Who's this shark guy? What's going on? Is it Left Shark? Well, he made his comic book debut back in Superboy Volume 4. He was born in Hawaii and he's a humanoid shark which I probably didn't need to point out, but his father is the king of all sharks, literally referred to as the shark god. So he was responsible for a few missing persons case, of course, being a hungry shark living in Hawaii and all, and it took a combination of heavy weaponry and sheer luck just to bring him in. Sam Makoa was the one who had to bring him in as well. What a unlucky ship. And several officers were actually taken out during this, so it was quite a mess. Now, as far as his origins go, for the Suicide Squad movie, they could go either way because his sharkness is rumored to come from a variety of sources. He says his dad is a shark god, but others have said he's just a wild man, which is a race of humanoid animals, and the government thinks he's just a savage mutation from an experiment gone wrong. Either way, he's kind of cute and he's a shark, so I love him. Number seven, Parasite. Rudolph Rudy Jones. He made his first appearance in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 58, and he started off as a janitor at the Pittsburgh branch of Star Labs, but like anything else that happens at Star Labs, his life was soon changed forever because there was an accident. Well, not really an accident, but while nobody was around, Darkseid turned Rudy into this new version of the Parasite. See, he had existed before Crisis on Infinite Earths, but then that's when Maxwell Jensen was Parasite, so. Darkseid controlled him, made him open a waste container, and then he was exposed to this radiation that turned him into this new green skin, well, Parasite, of course. So now Rudy has the ability to absorb all the life out of others, leaving just a skeleton sitting there behind. How gross would that be defined on a bus? Now his own body constantly needs to consume more and more or else he won't be able to survive. Hungry, hungry parasite, what a menace. Number six, Bronze Tiger. Ben Turner is one of the best when it comes to martial arts. He actually is the best. He studied with Richard Dragon under the O Sensei, but was later brainwashed by the League of Assassins. So we have a great fighter, and then just like that, we have a well-trained fighter on their team. Awesome, that was sick, what's the point of that? He's one of the coolest members because he doesn't have powers, which is amazing, and I had to include him in this list. He's just that good at fighting. He has quick reflexes, and he's mastered pretty much every style of fighting. Be it boxing, jiu-jitsu, karate, mai tai, taekwondo, you name it, he can break your arms in so many ways. I think that's a better way of putting it. His chai manipulation ability certainly does come in handy though. 
He uses this to enhance his concentration and heal quicker. In Suicide Squad issue seven, Bronze Tiger is actually able to defeat the speedster Bull Shoy. So no powers, but he can still take out a speedster. That's pretty impressive. Number five, Windfall. Wendy Jones, a former member of the Masters of Disaster, made her DC debut back in Batman in the Outsiders issue nine. Now she got her powers originally after her mother let her company perform DNA experiments on Wendy and her sister Becky. It was so awful what they went through that Becky actually took out her own mother later in life because of this. She was not happy and she carried a lot of guilt. So her and her sister were once part of the Masters of Disaster, but while Wendy was in school later on, these frat guys assaulted her, to say the least, just awful human beings, and one of those jerks' father was the local district attorney, and he refused to make a case for her when she reported it because of her past as a supervillain. Although his own son is a piece of shit monster. For sure, that makes sense, good logic. Now the college actually kicked Wendy out for this whole scandal, scandal, so Wendy returned later to the college and got some good old fashioned revenge, suffocating that same fraternity by removing the air from their house. So after she was put in Bell Rave Penitentiary, then that's when Amanda recruited her for the Suicide Squad. Number four, Count Vertigo. The villain that makes you puke. Werner Vertigo made his first debut in World's Finest issue 251 and he comes from the Vladivan royal family. And like his name gives away, his superpower is Pretty unique and kind of gross. He makes his enemies disoriented, okay? So he started off by going against Black Canary and Green Arrow, but eventually he made his way to the Suicide Squad. Now, his initial plan before the Suicide Squad was quite simple. He went to Star City to steal back some jewels that his parents had sold when they escaped to England after the war. So he was born with an inner ear problem that affected his balance. So he had a device that helped out planted in the right side of his temple. Now, after messing around with the device, which is something you don't do with any device near your temple, he realized that he had the ability to distort others' perception. Now, it was so bad that they couldn't tell which way was up or down. So he ended up on the naughty list, of course but he accepted an offer to join the Suicide Squad in order to get his prison sentence reduced. Number three, Deadshot. Played by the Fresh Prince himself, Will Smith, in the other Suicide Squad movie, Deadshot, AKA Floyd Lawton, made his first comic book debut in Batman issue 59. His origin stories are pretty dark, okay? So his parents were both wealthy and they idolized his older brother, Edward, a lot. Now his father was unfaithful, so his mother actually asked her two sons to take him out. That's terrible. So Edward locked Floyd in the boathouse because Floyd wanted to go and at least warn his father, you know, tell him what was going on. So Floyd broke out and he grabbed a hunting rifle where he climbed a tree and saw that his brother had already shot his father. He wasn't dead, but he was paralyzed after the first shot. But then when Edward was preparing to take another shot to end him, Floyd aimed his rifle and shot at him. Now, Floyd meant to disarm him. He meant to, but the branch that he was on had snapped at the last second. So that bullet actually went through the middle of his eyes, which uh, dished out a lot more damage than he intended to. So he took out the brother he loved to protect the father that he hated. That sounds just like a DC villain, if you ask me. So after that point, he was trained by David Kane to become the professional assassin we now know as Deadshot. Number two, Enchantress, AKA June Moon. She made her first debut back in Strange Adventures issue 187 back in 1966, where right at the top it says, meet the switcheroo witcheroo, the Enchantress. Now it sounds fun, but she's actually a nightmare. She of course is a member of the Suicide Squad and Cara Delevingne played her in the first movie, but in the comics her origins are pretty tragic. See, June Moon was a freelance artist who was dating this guy named Alan Dell. Dell invited her out one evening to a party at the haunted Terror Castle, which sounds like a good time for sure. But while she was there, she fell into a chamber with this being named Zaymor, which granted her witch powers. So now every time she says the name Enchantress, she changes into a green-eyed, powerful Enchantress. The downside is whenever June uses these enchantress abilities and creates magic too quickly, her personality becomes volatile and evil, which explains how she dips into the villain role. And finally, number one, Amanda Waller. I have to cap this list off with the boss lady herself. She made her debut in DC Comics with Legends issue one, and she was a powerful political figure who has been in many law enforcement agencies. They referred to her as the wall because of how aggressive and stubborn she is. She rebuilt Task Force X with Rick Flagg assigned to work under who I mentioned at the beginning of this list. And eventually she revived the Suicide Squad under her own direction. She's a great character. I mean, Suicide Squad issue 10 was titled Up Against the Wall. It is a fan favorite with her. Many fans have pointed out that this was the issue where we had the biggest change of pace and it stepped it up for the Suicide Squad quite a bit. It's his epic story that puts the Dark Knight himself against Amanda Waller. 
So in this issue, Batman discovers the existence of the Suicide Squad, and his next step of action is to threaten Amanda and say that he's gonna blow the whistle on the whole operation, but Amanda doesn't handle that offer too well because, well, she's the one. She explains back to Batman that if he does this, she will use everything in her power to find out who he is and expose him. See, because he used his Matches Malone cover, he wasn't wearing gloves. So when he first investigated Bell Rave Penitentiary, no gloves means fingerprints. So that threat is not a bad threat at all, Amanda Waller. No powers and you're calling the shots. You're number one in my books. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Weasel. He's one of those new additions to the team in the highly anticipated James Gunn soft reboot, but who exactly is the sketchy looking villain? All I know is that James Gunn's brother is doing the physical stuff for him, which is great. He did all the work for Rocket Raccoon and Guardians of the Galaxy. So it's gonna be fun. Whatever it is, it's gonna be fun. But who is this guy? Is he powerful? Is he evil? What's his deal? Well, he made his first debut back in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 36. He made his mark at Stanford University working alongside Professor Martin Stein. Even before this happened, he wasn't liked by other students. He was deemed an unremarkable and unlikable man, and sadly was given the nickname Weasel. He wasn't a fan of this, obviously, it made him pretty insecure. So when he got hired as a teacher at Candermere University, he was easily fed up with the other faculty members as it was just those mean students grown up. So, of course. So he viewed them as a threat, obviously, and he dressed up like this weasel character and started taking them out. He started attacking them one by one. Now, as far as Suicide Squad members go, this is one of the weaker ones pulled out of Bell Rave Penitentiary. But he is going to be in the new film, so we got to talk about him at least a little bit. He didn't last long in the comics either. His last issue was Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad Special Issue 1, where during a mission to rescue Hawk, Weasel took out the Thinker, who I'll mention later on in this list. And then when Rick Flagg put on the Thinker's helmet, the Thinker's last thought took over and Rick ended up being the one to take the weasel out. I'm pretty sure this is gonna happen in the movie, but if not, we're still happy. He appeared later on in the comics as well, but this was during the Blackest Night storyline when he was revived as a Black Lantern. And before we continue on with this list of Suicide Squad members, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be great. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for your support. We're gonna get right back into the video. Let's go. Number nine, Bane. It's kind of hard to forget a villain like Bane. He's a big fan of, you know, breaking backs. And when you break the back of somebody like Batman, you're gonna have to be locked up away for probably a little while. Bane is a super smart villain and the steroid called Venom that's being pumped into his veins sure does help get the attention of the Suicide Squad. I mean, once you break the bat, that's a pretty good audition, I'd say. At the end of the series, Suicide Squad raised the flag. Amanda Waller recruited Bane to the Suicide Squad and we once again see Bane rocking the camel back of strength. He's got his Venom again, this time in Outsiders issue 50. The team makes their grand entrance and Bane right off the bat doesn't like following the instructions of leader Rick Flagg. Flagg says to just simply use the stun gun and Bane's like, nope, gonna do it my way. Thank you, sir. So it's no surprise when the team tricks Bane in Salvation Run issue two. See, they're assigned to ship villains to salvation by using boom tubes and Bane and Deadshot ended up being sent as well. Yeah, get that psycho out of here. Go, go break some other backs or don't break backs. How about that? Go back into jail. Number eight, Killer Croc. A face we saw in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, a face that's rather terrifying and a face you wouldn't really forget. Killer Croc, AKA Waylon Jones, made his first appearance in Detective Comics issue 523. He was born in Florida and faced a medical condition that, well, look at him, it turned him into a crocodile. When he was an adult, he began wrestling alligators at carnivals just to make ends meet, hence the name Killer Croc. That was his stage name at first. But realizing crime was suited best for Waylon, he left the carnival and became one of Gotham's most feared criminals. He wasn't a member until the recent 2016 run of Suicide Squad. And he's like, okay, anything but space. I'll do the missions as long as it's not in space. First mission they go to, space. Number seven, Outlaw. John Henry Martin made his first debut in Manhunter issue 16, but he did in fact join the Suicide Squad in issue 58 of the run from the early 90s. But where exactly did his villain journey start? Well, while John was serving time in prison, because that's how every supervillain starts in comics, this bomb called the Gene Bomb exploded and it gave him super strength and it allowed for him to be protected against attacks as well. He couldn't control his abilities well, but he did have these super abilities. He escaped prison, but he didn't get too far being, you know, unexperienced in his new abilities. So he, alongside other Gene Bomb metahuman victims, were put in Bell Rave prison, but they couldn't find any traces of these powers that he used, so they just had to send him back out to the first prison that he easily broke out of the first time around. And during the transportation to go back to that prison, he broke out near the Florida-Georgia border, 
and then Bob's your uncle. Number six, Adam Smasher. He's the grandson of the supervillain Cyclotron, so you already know he's gonna be a hard time. Meet Albert Rothstein. He made his comic book debut at All-Star Squadron issue 25, and his powers were passed down those powers being pretty spectacular. He can control the size of his body. He can change his molecular structure and he was also the godson of the golden age version of the Atom, Al Pratt. In 52, issue 24, Amanda Waller recruits Adam Smasher to go against Black Adam. He actually recruits the squad himself where he brings on Count Vertigo, Electrocutioner, Persuader, Plastic, and Captain Boomerang 2. Number five, Captain Boomerang. Okay, so I mentioned Captain Boomerang 2, but we gotta talk about the original, the OG Captain Boomerang. We saw him in the first Suicide Squad movie played by Jack Courtney, and he made his first appearance back in The Flash, issue 117. George Harkness was originally a Flash villain, and if you can take on the fastest man alive, eh, you've got a pretty good resume. So far, so good. His skill set shouldn't shock you, given his name, Captain Boomerang. He was the son of an American toy maker, and he created these special boomerangs that helped him get into trouble. Alongside his pal, Mick Wentworth. Nothing more intimidating than a guy with boomerangs, okay? So of course, Amanda Waller had to recruit this wacky villain. In exchange for a pardon and a prison release, of course, he was sent in to attack Brimson Stone at Mount Rushmore. I'm excited to see James Gunn's version of Captain Boomerang. He's said to be more or so the same as his version from the last one, but we'll see. He might have a little flashier outfit. I'm okay with that. Number four, Kimo. He made his first debut at Showcase issue 39 in a story called The Deathless Doom. Now, the scientist kept failing one experiment after another, but he kept working. He was dedicated to the cause. For science, people, science. So Kimo was not the name of a scientist. No, the scientist's name was Ramsey Norton. Kimo would be an awful name for a scientist. Kimo was the name he had given this plastic vessel to store all these chemicals after the experiments had failed. Big old vat of yuck. So when he finally added some failed growth formula to the mix, this vat came to life. This toxic creation who kept the name Kimo, of course. He ended up taking out the poor scientist that had created him, which is right off the bat, truly evil stuff. I feel bad for Kimo though, I'll be honest, because he didn't find out he wasn't a living thing until Supergirl told Told him in Supergirl Volume 4, Issue 5. She told him he's just a collection of chemicals and he was so upset he dispersed himself in the atmosphere and then it rained. In Adventures of Superman, he did join the Suicide Squad briefly in Issue 593. He worked alongside Manchester Black, Plasmus, and Shrapnel and their plan was to take out Superman. Number three, The Thinker. He made his first debut in The Flash, Issue 12, back in the 40s and he's been around for quite a while. And while his alias doesn't sound too intimidating, Clifford DeVoe is not one you want to mess around with. We can see him in the the trailers for James Gunn's Suicide Squad, and I feel like he'll be around in the movie for quite a while. It seems like he's in a quite a good amount of shots. He began his life as Keystone City's district attorney back in 1913, but his life changed when he joined mob boss Norvac one night when he was intoxicated. Just one of those decisions you make when you're drunk and you're like, well, I guess I'm just gonna roll with it. He offered his skills, well, his services rather, as a thinker, a preparer of alibis and legal precedents in order to keep bad guys out of jail. So Novak was like, score, we could definitely use you on our team. Let's go, here's a house, enjoy. So Novak was later on tricked by the thinker himself when he shot at a reflection in a steel mirror, which caused the bullet to ricochet and then hit himself. So the thinker wasn't even involved in this case. He had nothing to do with it, really. He got on the Flash's naughty list, but when the thinker developed the thinking cap, it allowed him to project mental force upon his enemies. So he's got the brains and power to take down many foes. He accepted a mission with the Suicide Squad in order to get a full pardon, where he was seemingly taken out by the weasel of all people. But in reality, he survived because he's smarter than that. He's a thinker. He actually went on to become friends with Jay Garrick. And you know what? We love a change of heart. Number two, Peacemaker. John Cena himself is making his debut as Peacemaker in James Gunn's Suicide Squad, but he's also getting his own spin-off series. How exciting is this? But he was first asked about the role during DC fandom, Cena himself compared the character to a terrible cocky Captain America, which sounds about right. So Christopher Smith showed up early in comics with the Fight in 5 issue 40. That was when he was with Charlton Comics. He was part of a paramilitary force that kept the world safe. I mean, he didn't even carry weapons that could cause bodily harm. That's how much he meant well. But then after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he entered DC Comics with the same name, only now he has no problem taking out bad guys, all while spreading peace and love. So the guy's a Maniac, basically. To be honest, I could probably watch this guy for an entire season of a show. Definitely. John Cena is great. He's so funny and he's also so ripped and humongous and terrifying. So it's gonna be a good time. And finally, number one. 
Killer Frost. Louise Lincoln, aka Killer Frost. She's actually the second Killer Frost in the comics, but she made her debut with Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 21. She was actually a friend and co-worker of the previous Killer Frost, but after that Frost had passed away, somebody had to step up, right? So she repeated the same experiment and voila, we have a new and improved Killer Frost. She immediately went after Firestorm because, you know, they were to blame for the death of the previous Frost, which is always great when we have a villain do a nice grudgy start like that. She ended up selling her soul to Neron for more power, so it's safe to say you want to keep your distance with this one. She joined the Suicide Squad briefly in the comics, and she was also a key member in the animated Suicide Squad film, Hell to Pay. Kicking off the list at number 10, Slipknot. Yeah, so he was in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, but he didn't last long. I think he was in the movie for 46 seconds, maybe longer felt like 46. He got robbed. He's actually really cool in the comics. He's a mercenary who can climb anything. He uses his trusty ropes and grappling hooks, and being a formidable assassin, he should have probably survived longer in that movie. He joined the team in Fury of Firestorm versus the Suicide Squad. In the comics, he and Captain Boomerang believed that the bombs Waller had strapped to their arms were fake just like in the movie. So Slipknot tried to make a run for it, and in doing so, he got his arm blown to smithereens. And at that point, Captain Boomerang was like, mm, okay, maybe they're real, maybe they're real. Okay, I believe you. And before we continue on with this list of powerful Suicide Squad members, guys, if you wanna go ahead and hit that thumbs up, because it really does help us out quite a bit here at our studio. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now let's get right back to the list. Number nine. Tatsu Yamashiro was a member of David Ayer's Suicide Squad, and she made her comic book debut in The Brave and the Bold, issue 200. She's a skilled martial artist who wields the Soul Taker sword, which sounds as cool as it is. Her husband's soul is actually one of the many that are trapped inside said sword. She trained as a samurai under Master Tadishi, and then she suited up and headed to America to join the fight for justice. She joined the Suicide Squad in Volume 5, issue 27. Other than being a powerful member of the squad, she's also been a key member of The Outsiders. Number eight, Blockbuster. This absolute unit entered Detective Comics in 1965, issue 345. Mark Desmond was kind of a Bruce Banner situation. Kind of. He was a brilliant scientist who felt like he was too scrawny, yet he wanted to become stronger, he wanted to be bigger. He wanted to get ripped and Sarah's discovery wasn't cutting it, so what did he do? He created a serum that just made him strong because that's what you do in comics. He got super strength, but unfortunately the serum side effects resulted in him being a mindless brute and he no longer was capable of talking as well. He was part of the Suicide Squad in the comics, but again, not for long. One of those characters that was cut too short. In Legends issue three, Task Force X is sent to Mount Rushmore to take out Brimstone, but Brimstone actually used his fire powers against Blockbuster and Muscles versus Fire. Usually fire is gonna win that battle. Muscles versus Fire. Fire is probably gonna win nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten, definitely. So that was Blockbuster's last appearance, short and sweet. Number seven, El Diablo. This was a key member in the climax of David Ayer's Suicide Squad, Cheto Santana. He joined the team in 2011 with the new 52's version of the Suicide Squad. And his powers, well, yeah, you probably guessed it. Similar to that fire guy I was just talking about. He has the powers of pyrokinesis, and when he uses up all of his power, like we saw on the big screen, he can become much larger. He grows wings too. He straight up becomes a fire demon. How scary is that? Now he's got quite the temper. Back before his Suicide Squad days were even upon him, he burned down an entire building just to settle a score with a gang. But then when he realized that innocent people were involved, obviously he turned himself in. So he's trying, you know? Number six. Black Manta. David Hyde, most would recognize as a major Aquaman villain, AKA Black Manta. The most recent incarnation of the villain was introduced in Aquaman Volume 7, Issue 7. He grew up on a houseboat, excelling in diving and treasure hunting, and his parents were divorced and he stuck with his father, Jesse Hyde. Cause yeah, treasure hunting beats pretty much whatever's going on on mom's side. Sorry. They were looking for the Black Pearl, which wasn't a ship with Johnny Depp drunk aboard, Rather, it was a pearl that granted its users hydrokinetic abilities. And in Teen Titans Volume 6, Issue 10, David found that pearl. He later joined the squad in Volume 4 when he thought Aquaman had perished, because he figured, well, nothing better to do. Might as well just join this team and do some, some villain stuff. Number five, Mind Boggler. First appearing in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 29, Leia Wasserman is a punk rocker who just happens to have been given powers by Breathtaker of the Assassination Bureau. Those powers being mind control, and she's actually really, really good at it. Her name is Mind Boggler, so she must be, right? She can make the walls seem like they're closing in, resulting in her victim to suffer a loss of equilibrium that they just instantly feel nauseous. Hey, it's Mind Boggler. Yeah. <laughs> One sec. 
She was on the Suicide Squad, but Captain Boomerang let her get riddled with bullets. You know, because she humiliated him for harassing another member. So yeah, Captain Boomerang's kind of the worst. Number four, Mr. 104. Not to be confused with Mr. 305, although they are very similar. We now go to Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad Special. He's originally a Doom Patrol villain, but they all teamed up to rescue Hawk in Nicaragua. So I had to include this guy because, well, he would be much different now if he came around in the comics or the movies. Mr. 104 can transform his body into any of the elements. See, back then there were only 104. Now this dude could have transformed into 118 or whatever the number is. Unfortunately, his time as a Suicide Squad member was cut short while they were fighting the Rocket Red Brigade. Number three, Punch and Jewelie. A two for one combo coming right at you. Okay, so this criminal duo made their first appearance in Secret Origins Volume 2, Issue 28, and they're not taken seriously by most, but they've been known to be just as unpredictable as the Joker and Harley Quinn. See, Jewelie grew up in Brooklyn with Punch and they worked as puppeteers at Coney Island during the day, which sounds like a blast. But at nighttime, the couple drifts into the shadows and they become thieves. They came across a container filled with alien weaponry and they used it to create this underground base in Coney Island. And their criminal super career was born. They were recruited by the Suicide Squad in issue 24 of Ostrander's run in the 80s, but they left when a pregnancy came into the picture. Probably a good time to quit a Suicide Squad. I'd agree on that departure for sure. Number two, Captain Cold. Leonard Snart made his debut in Showcase issue eight. Now, Leonard enjoyed the company of his grandfather who ran an ice cream truck but after he passed away, Leonard had to just spend his remaining days with his father, who was just a terrible parent all around. So this led to Leonard joining a group of thieves, but he was caught by the Flash. See, originally he was a Flash villain. So next he studied the energy emissions of a cyclotron and figured, hmm, maybe it could work against this Flash guy. So he designed a weapon that could freeze people using the moisture in the air. Frozone style. And then he later on joined the squad in issue 17. I would be pretty pumped to see Captain Cold in live action. I feel like we need an evil Frozone on the big screen, that's for sure. And finally coming in at number one, Poison Ivy. Pamela Isley, there we go. She joined the team in issue 33. She actually stuck around for quite a while. She made her comic book debut way back earlier in Batman issue 181. She studied botany in Seattle, and after she was poisoned from special herbs, she got these fantastic abilities, and now she's invulnerable to all these poisons, and after spending some time in prison, after run-ins with the bat, she was recruited to the Suicide Squad. Like I said, she stuck around for quite a while. She helped the team out from issues 33 to 66. Now around the same time, she was also spreading deadly toxins around Gotham City in hopes that the only remaining citizens would be those naturally immune. So yeah, she's kind of a big bad deal. 